Thank you for joining XR Home, which is India's first AR VR MR focused podcast. And today I'm really delighted to have with me not one, but two guests. Tim Stutz, director of product design at Faceware, and was previously part of IBM Watson and Magic Leap. And my other guest is Shubhajit Chatterjee, who is project manager and IT management at QWR. So, guys, welcome to the podcast. Really happy to have you on the show. Starting with Tim, maybe you know, give a small introduction on what you've been doing. So, I uh, I originally got introduced to working in AR um, when I was doing contract work for Honda Research Institute. So, we worked on automotive head-up display concepts. Um, for like situational awareness. So you can imagine like a, a deer or, or, or like a, a car breaking in front of you as you're driving and then wanting to see, um, signage, augmented content to kind of show you, Hey, you need to get out of the way or here's another path you might consider to get around this braking vehicle. So we at the time working more conceptually, uh, explored concepts of, um, uh, projection on a windshield. And that, to, to get that projection, you'd have to leverage sensors and cameras around the parameter of the car. And then you'd also have to track uh, the user's uh, head pose, eye position, um, so that the content on the windshield would align properly. And then, of course, the windshield needs to be, have enough luminance so that you can see all of this. And, you know, at the time, all those pieces hadn't really come together. So it was more uh, concept-based stuff. But it, like, Eight years later, we're seeing vehicles enter the market that have this feature. So that's really exciting. Um, moving forward, uh, I worked at Magic Leap for uh, about four years. I uh, joined in 2016, so I was one of the one of the early-ish employees, and I got to work on the the operating system for the device. Uh, I focused on text input, haptic feedback, LED patterns in the hardware. Uh, Input in general, uh, settings and privacy, um, and so forth. So, um, yeah. And now I currently work at, uh, Faceware Technologies. I'm director of product design there. We do facial motion capture, um, to drive 3D, um, animated content. So we're, we basically have camera setups, like head mounted, uh, cameras or HMCs rather than HMDs as they're known, where a camera is pointed back at the face, captures the face, and then we track the face algorithmically, and then we use it to drive a 3D model in Unity or Unreal or Maya. Um, the end result is um, can be anything from like a cin- cinematic content in a game or film, but it can also be live, uh, like live animatronics or someone working live at a trade show, interacting with with people behind a curtain, but as a 3D uh, avatar. So yeah, that's me um, in a nutshell. Moving on to Shubhaji. Shubhaji, do you want to talk about a little bit of yourself and your background and what you've been doing? Yeah, I, I haven't started in XR in general. So I, st- I was quite interested in games since my childhood. So I started my career in that. By, like My first job was working in Ubisoft as a game tester, as well as a uh, developer assistant. So from from the like from the general liking of games, I got introduced to the VR world since I was working in Ubisoft, and we had a lot of new technologies coming in, especially from PS5 to Xbox developer kits coming in and seeing new technologies. As uh, moving forward, then I started working in Question What's Real uh, as a blockchain uh, researcher. My main interest lied in hardware. I'm a tech head in general. So I love hardware and more specifically, I love the, how the VR hardware is now being manufactured because unlike smartphones, VR hardware is quite different where it comes to sensor fusions, incorporating displays with lenses, optics, and uh, all combined to give a head mounted device. And right now, my major job in this company is managing operations as well as doing the tech side, testing the hardware side of the products that we get in. That's me. You also have been vested into different kind of things, you know, from games to blockchain to hardware. Question what's real? I mean, I I would, uh, I mean, give a shout out because I think it's one of the one of the really interesting startups that, that that's that's come out of India. I mean, the kind, kind of work that you guys are doing, you know, whether it's the oral AR headset or the virtual ID 3 of VR1 headset, I think that's really, really exceptional. And I really wish you guys, I mean, more success and more power. Yeah. So uh, 
Tim, getting back to you, you have been a part of besides Honda, a very very interesting company, which is Magic Leap. Magic Leap obviously was one of those that company which kind of like brought attention to augmented reality. But there's that other side of people who not like Magic Leap because you know they are they are the one of the first guys who got huge funding, four billion dollar. But the product was not there. The prototype came in, and uh, then the CEO had to move out. One of the guys who was with Magic Leap kind of moved out, built their own company called Enreal, and. They are doing well at this point in time. Uh, they, in fact, they have a headset market which is around five hundred five hundred dollars. Uh, and, and at the same time, Magically, which was one of the most vested company with so much money, but still has a product which is somewhere around two thousand uh, plus. So, w- would you like to talk a little bit about Magically? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so basically, uh, yeah, the company has undergone um, a, a quite a bit of transition in the past couple of years. Uh, after an initial launch, um, we called it Creators Launch. This would have been fall or actually late summer of 2018. Uh, we basically launched to consumers and enterprise dually. So we came out with a bunch of exciting content um, for gamers on the device, uh, like uh, Tanandi and, and Create and some of these exciting immersive apps. And we work to develop an ecosystem where other developers could come in and put content out, release to our store. Um, at the same time, there was the enterprise focus. So um, there was a focus in uh, m- medical industry with Brain Lab and, and some of our other enterprise partners. Uh, there was a lot of excitement around um, around like co-presence and and working in the same physical space with each user wearing a device and looking at a 3d model of a, of a shoe or a human heart and um yeah so what we what we launched with though i think we realized quickly um that the price point um we knew was high but th- there wasn't a, enough new content coming on device to justify the cost of the device for most consumers. However, I mean, one thing to say for the enterprise space, the Magic Leap 1 is a pretty high quality um, device. It's really, um, it's in a different category than Unreal, which, you know, as you mentioned, was was um, the product of an ex-Magic Leap employee. Um, and Unreal has a, there's a place for for that too, that, that market, um, for, for sure. But Magic Leap is a, a very high quality um, HMD. It, it, HoloLens and um, HoloLens 2 and Magic Leap 1 are still probably um, among the only two on the market that have um, the dis- that display capability that that is that is helping to drive these like enterprise apps forward. Also, Magic Leap 1 has a six DOF control, which is which is very useful for a number of applications. So yeah, even though there was a kind of shuffle um, last year um, when the company really came to terms that it needed to focus on enterprise, they still have a device on the market which uh, you know is is suitable. Um, moving forward to Ma- to Magic Leap Two, um, I, there is even more focus on the enterprise. So you can go on the even just going on the website, you'll see that the the old uh, leaper is and and whale and the gymnasium are are no longer there, which is kind of sad in a way. But there's an emphasis on uh, use cases and in medicine and manufacturing and more practical applications. And I think down the road there could be entertainment applications as well. Um, but for now, I think the focus on enterprise is is important and. Um, yeah, so that's where the company is at, in in my assessment. Right. Uh, would you like to talk about your works at Magic Leap? Yes, obviously, I do completely agree that uh, HoloLens and Magic Leap are the only two enterprise-ready uh, mixed reality headset with the capabilities, obviously, which enterprise are looking for. But with the COVID and the impact which has happened globally, how soon adoption is going to happen uh, is is my second question. The first question being your your works and your contribution at uh, Magic Leap. So I joined at an interesting time. Um, 
uh, where there was no uh, text input to the OS yet. In fact, the OS was in its infancy. The OS being Lumen OS um, was being developed by our software team. Um, and there was other content um, like like Tanandi and Create, but those were developed on um, on Unity Game Engine. So there was a lot of existing framework to work with there. The team I worked on uh, in Lumen OS, um, we saw like buttons from the beginning and text fields, and we got to see all of these things develop gra- more gradually over time. So when I worked on the keyboard, like one week uh, we would have buttons, and then the next week we'd be able to support um, uh, like text on the buttons. And so it was just, it was a pretty exciting time. And also having the, like a more, I don't want to say gradual timeline because it feels so, like, it feels like we could have spent so much more time on text entry, but having like, having the time allowed us to really refine uh, text entry and think about things like ergonomics. And, and, you know, originally I mentioned you had to use the touchpad to type. And so when six off came online, it was like, well, should we make it all sixed off now? Should we use the touchpad for something else? And it was decided that no, we could actually still do both. So we came up with a pretty nice mechanism where you could you could point and type or click uh, buttons in your space or just rest your finger by your side, your hand by your side and use the touchpad. And so having that d- dual support was really interesting. But one of my goals, in addition to designing and prototyping this keyboard was to find ways to eliminate them. I was really excited when we um, we used uh, iris recognition in a later update, and that allowed users to no longer have to type PIN numbers. Um, and there's just other steps, like, like sharing social media content, where we were able to cut through a lot of text entry um, and, and come with something more streamlined. Um, other things I did on the device, uh, supporting, designing the support around Bluetooth keyboard, external keyboard for text entry and also touchpad. Voice dictation, um, that was another feature I worked on and eventually led the LED pattern effort uh, on, on our hardware. So the wearable has a single LED that's used mostly for sur- like surveillance indicators. So whether to show, uh, we had a privacy requirement where we had to indicate to an onlooker if they were being recorded uh, with video or, or uh, photo. Um, we also had to indicate if object recognition was, cur- was occurring. So we had another pattern for that. And then finally voice input. And so that was really interesting, trying out different color combinations, testing out different motion, put in and running user tests to figure out like, well, does, what do users think? Well, a lot of LEDs for a control, uh, but we leveraged that too for to reinforce like touch interactions. Uh, and again, like having a sunrise kind of startup pattern, but this time moving clockwise um, around the device and counterclockwise for, uh, for shutting down like a sunset. Um, beyond that, um, I worked on, I kind of was the liaison with, uh, the Sonic Arts team as they did sound design for the operating system. Well, there was a lot of spatial sound design there and I worked closely with that team. I remained an individual contributor, but I also, uh, led the design of settings. We had, we had people who were more focused on, um, the actual design contribution, but I would oversee those efforts and make sure they were connected with the right folks in the org. The last thing I worked on, which was really exciting, um, was object recognition on the platform. There was a ob- object labels that would show up on the headset. You'd be walking around and if you had to turn them on on your device, you would see labels popping up. And I remember walking into a room one day and seeing that there were labels already there. And I had this thought, I was like, I never walked here. Like, and it, it knows the label, it knows these objects already. And then of course the answer is that someone else has been walking around using the device, contributing to the cloud layer and I'm seeing them. And that was a real magic moment. And uh, you know, that I, I, we kind of got to see like the metaverse come alive. <laughs> but how cool is that? You know, I mean, when you're building a hardware, nobody, I mean, you know, when you, when, when you purchased it, nobody thinks about the work that's gone behind, you know? There is so many different layers to it. You know, you spoke about, you know, text keyboard, sound design, capture app, object recognition, you know, and, and so much, you know, which which kind of like 
comes together you know and there are so many people who are working together can they try you know try and solve each of those parts and, and then to build something which gives you a, a great experience you know so cheers to that and i hope that in couple of, couple of years we have something like this you know subhajit moving on to you i mean you are standing against giants you know because there's this company facebook i mean you know which is kind of like working to democratize you know the, the, the ar vr you know and they are they are putting their money where the mouth is you know because they are ready to bear the the loss but give a product uh, at a cost which is kind of really difficult you know so what are your views on the competitors and do talk about your products both oral and vr one sure i'm going to start with our products one is oral which is a smart glass smart audio glass is basically this is our first take on teaching the consumers in india of hands free living so with this uh, our main objective with the oral was to give a fast fashion product that goes uh, along with the youth as well as serves a purpose with that so if you are comparing our glasses with airpods or any uh, tws earphones you can see the distinction here is that both of them as a device are tws but the difference is one is a glass which suits to your design full suits to your fashion and other one is just a one particular function if you consider airpods is just for listening hearing aid with the oral we our product was quite a hit uh, we did less of marketing and still we were sold out pretty much in one uh, half of one and a half months and there are still orders coming in but with the due to pandemic and conditions we are unable to serve further more than them but soon we are going to start again now moving on to vr1 vr1 was quite a different take when you are comparing here because there were like you said there were giants ready with their own devices with six dot devices with pc connect but the thing is that we still went on with a three dot device because we thought we saw the consumers right only a niche consumer knew how to use and how to get maximum uh, advantage from a six dot device but rest of the people they need to uh, take baby steps to understand what the device a vr device can do so with that objective we introduce a three dot device in the indian market and we kept a price point where at a mid range mobile phone where everyone can afford that this lead led us to more institutional adoption where we saw quite a big interest from education sector and especially during the pandemic which uh, like led uh, online classes more vr1 was a quite a unique device where teachers could teach some uh, area aspects of uh, any, any subject in more details rather than having a 2d view of uh, 2d view lessons bringing to this comp- uh, comparing with Uh, how we are standing with the giants right now actually we are not competing with them we are helping them to have a firm establishment in india because in the end we have to work together to get reach a maximum of the market and someone has to take initiative of making a low end device and giving a uh, in house support because when comparing to quest to like you said facebook uh, uh, selling quest to at a quite a dirt cheap rate but the issue comes arises that by the time it reaches india and all tax and import comes into it the cost comes down to double of what you are getting it outside what are your views on that tim and and shubhajit i mean do you see the big guys kind of understanding that the only way to move this technology forward so that it reaches mass adoption is logically would be working together but do you see that happening yeah. maybe shubhajit you could start and then maybe tim could kind of add on to that uh currently situation yes uh, like the situation right now is not telling in the other way but if you see i will give you a best example how ios the interface of ios led to uh, uh, mass changes in android uh, ui so ios was the one that created the ui the touch interface and in the end android adopted it and even the small players of android if you take individual companies they are using the same pattern i see the similar pattern happening here where if you consider magically they greatly worked as tim said they greatly worked on the ui and user experience these elements can be taken up by the small companies and devil, uh, and further extend the use case with it and comparing to hardware devices yes there's going to be a market where a big competitor can always give up but get a better advantage 
but people tend to forget that is that government regulation comes is a key adoption factor here so in the end maybe i can see facebook or microsoft partnering up with the small players in india and creating a geographical specific devices for that area and then serving through these small players right tim would, would you like to add into that um so yeah i do th- i do see magic leap going broad um in the long run i think apple is going to stay more narrow you're going to need to be apple hardware to run in the apple ecosystem uh facebook i think will probably go more narrow too one of the challenges with facebook um is that uh the current you know the current way they're monetized off of surveillance capitalism is is creating the opportunity to come in at a really low price point but there's a lot of other challenges a lot of other uh ethical challenges um and so if you're government or enterprise you might have second thoughts before uh wanting to work with uh facebook at an enterprise level um i don't believe that will stop the growth nor the um the the new players coming in um but i i would be really surprised if a uh, a third party piece of hardware would work on a like infrastructure that facebook created i think again it's going to be more closed off kind of like apple that's that's my feeling and a lot of it has to do with um the the monetization model and the way that works so like why would you let another device uh, with different privacy settings and so forth on that ecosystem um it's going to it's kind of like all or nothing so that's that's the way i see it right so so do you think this world garden approach is, is right for us the consumers or, or the enterprise because like you rightfully pointed out apple facebook magic leap you know they are all building their own world little wall garden so that nobody can breach into but there are these startups from around the world who are taking the other approach where they are creating an open model a yeah. inter- operable model where privacy is first keeping that into account people in general post covid mainly are frustrated of how these big tech companies have been taking advantage of us or data juicing it to create products and services do you think this is somewhere going to breach because there are startups who are brave and doing really really cool stuff yeah like example, qwr you know not not just yep. qwr there there are people around the world technology is being democratized knowledge at one point in time was you know monopolized if you say it could be just be it was the harvards or the mit's you know but right now it's it's on the net and it's it's created you know if you have the desire and intent you can connect with anyone and everyone create your own startup and create build your own products like you right i mean we we were having this conversation earlier that you know magic leap took 4 billion dollars to build a prototype then there's enreal who's done it in 10 times down the cost because obviously those guys did the hard work and these guys kind of like you know uh, tinkered around or, you know back engineered and added their little thing and, and it's it's they're different product i mean they're you know bottom line they're just different products it's it's the Matt, then red real and real didn't create a magic leap they built they built um and their end real system uh it's the slam calculations are not what the magic leap is but there's a huge pl- there's a big there's a big but who goes mm-hmm. down in entry history uh, is the the man who kind of first builds it or, or the one who kind of democratizes it well that's a great question and i think the the the, the democratization is a, is the right step i microsoft i know is historically uh always been a big player with with windows and so forth and in Holo, with hololens they're also a big player they're coming they're coming into the market early they have a device they've thought about the cloud compute solution um they are allowing 
they are allowing other devices to plug into that ecosystem. Um, and so I don't see that stopping. I think what we're going to see is more devices plugging into the, the Microsoft ecosystem. Um, now, um, smaller developers may decide not like that. That's not where they want to plug in, or maybe they can't plug in due to logistical reasons. Like there could be a number of reasons, right? But a bigger company with with its vast sources of revenue, I think, will kind of trailblaze in terms of showing that connected piece and work with the um, work with the telecoms and so forth to make that happen. Um, but I do. I do hope that other um, smaller companies are able to band together and, and do something too. And I think ultimately, um, as idealistic as it sounds, I think it would be great if, if like if like the internet, we're all kind of just on on this mesh together. It, things start often start from like a central, more centralized source, and then they proliferate out. I'm really excited to see um, all the open initiatives around um, XR, like open XR and XR access for accessibility. Um, these efforts and like other things like Voices of VR podcasts and like are going to help um, promote openness in the ecosystem. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think we'll get there. It, it's just it's just a matter of time. I don't think it's going to be a, I don't think it's going to be a grassroots movement. I don't think the smaller companies are going to come together and be the first to come up with a solution. I do think the bigger companies with with revenue and resources will do that. And and the smaller companies the world will see that that's possible. And then the, the grassroots orgs will come up. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I completely agree when you say that, you know, you need capital to kind of build things. But I'm not talking about timelines, which is like two years. I'm talking about 20 years, you know, when it kind of things kind of really matures, the price point comes really down. Who would be able to leverage that kind of situation when blockchain kind of matures? And, and you know, I'm, I'm talk, maybe it's, it's too far out in the future. But what, what I'm trying to say is that I see a world where I think we need to start holding joining hands together from right now or you know uh, the the david will kill, will be killing the go- goliath uh, 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 shubhajit what are your views on that and if you are looking forward in 20 years i think the major part will be where the hardware is open source because software open source is considerably much faster than the hardware because hardware manufacturing is quite difficult so once there are small niche player that can do the hardware manufacturing by themselves and people can actually make their own hardware. I think uh, if you, the best example would be the Motorola Ara project. I think where it was a modular phone where you can get your own, you can put a display of according to your need. Something like that, if when we reach to that level, I think then the two democratization will happen. Software evolves around time and usually what happens is that the small players always takes hints and uh, copies or makes a clone from the bigger guys and they do it in a such a way that the IP has not been broken by them. So that's a pretty smart way to move forward. But in the end, software can be copied. The major thing they will have control is on hardware. We are building a headset. Maybe it's going to look like this. A a phone and a computer is going to merge into one single wearable device. And once that happens, uh, the the end user, wherever he or she is looking, the data is going to be captured. You know, we also laying down the building blocks of the metaverse, you know. So do you see uh, the the future of the spatial web or the metaverse that we are... is privacy going to be built into it or is it going to be run by the tech behemoths? You know, maybe Shubhajit, since you are there on, on the screen, maybe you can start with that. And then so, uh, there's just two challenges. What I see is that either you can have a privacy without a good user experience or you can have an excellent user experience in cost of privacy. So it's it depends on the company, how they approach it. If you take consider Apple, Apple has not given much thought, like they are very concrete on the privacy, but Apple has also taken care of their user experience it's just purely because they have a closed ecosystem. But coming to other companies, right? So there's always a trade off because if you consider Facebook here, Facebook needs more data from the users to improve their products. 
and if privacy comes into a focus i don't see uh facebook improving their products as scale as what apple is doing or microsoft doing right now right but then to uh yeah shivaji's second point i mean i i couldn't agree more um the privacy issue comes down to business models and if if in within an ecosystem we find a way for um users to to either pay for a pres- prescription kind of like we pay for internet service providers um we'll see differing approaches to privacy that um can help better protect the user's data typically um but you know as long as we have this kind like a kind of like freemium model um quote unquote uh within these within like bigger companies like like Facebook and so forth it's going to be problematic because the user's data is is essentially the product here that's being sold to advertisers and not say not to say that that's not a bad thing i mean advertisers get a a wide range of exposure on a platform like facebook some completely survive off of it but yeah it i mean facebook is going to a direction where they don't really i don't think they want the users to even think about the data they they don't want like they're one of their uh one of their principles uh, like uh uh facebook reality labs is like don't surprise people and this is and uh, one way of interpreting that is like just don't have users think about things just have like a seamless experience in which like i go online i go and maybe i walk around like a 3d virtual mall and i buy a product and then i i go offline and there in that transaction i didn't think about like how many other parties had access to my data or like how many onlookers with their aria devices happen to see me with their devices and using their devices sensory wear picked up on me i think in the in the ideal world that you the consumer isn't concerned because i what we've seen historically with companies like facebook is it when consumers have concern like with the cambridge analytica breach the value of the stock drops um you know the facebook it dropped a, the value the the value of the company dropped 100 billion dollars like after cambridge analytica they don't want things like that um But on the other hand, I think the the challenge of creating very very robust privacy settings with uh this this uh business approach of surveillance capitalism it's it's going to be a very difficult battle because you like the more transparency you give the user, the more you educate them through consent and so forth. I think the more they realize that oh, well I give this and in return I get this. like they're in their mind going to be like I don't know if that's worth it and also like I would pay $3 a month or $5 a month to not have that but then Facebook isn't going to provide that option the option is free so the privacy controls I think get the user in a place where they start to, like the ones who are informed start to weigh things out and wondering is it really worth it like this whole like this is whole way of communicating and sharing data really worth it so anyways that's going to be a a big challenge moving forward i think the hardest thing for facebook will be when apple releases um their glasses in the marketplace and we see the privacy settings on the apple products which uh you know Shivaji mentioned, you know, they're they're at an advantage because it's like a closed ecosystem and they have different ways of monetizing through a uh, subscription for instance rather than through advertisements. That's going to set a pretty high bar. I mean, Apple's pr- pr- going to do their best to protect your user data and they're going to make this pretty damn clear with their settings. Facebook the more settings they put around this the privacy fence, the the more difficult it's going to be for them um so that surveillance capitalism which you mentioned about you know it's it's kind of loop you know it's it's very hard to escape from it if you're building a product and, and if you are a closed ecosystem you are you, you know giving away things but the consumer in the end is is a product and that's not like a, the the best approach you know so so uh, 
India, you know, it, it's a huge market, and I think you know, content is going to play a huge role. And now you are the director of product design in Faceware. Would you like to kind of like talk about your product, both your hardware and software, what it does, and what's going to do to to uh, to content, and how important is India as a market for you? One of the things that I think Faceware has done well as a company is to differentiate between like the field of facial recognition and facial motion capture. The facial recognition field being um, primarily in, in, in government, law enforcement, in, and the facial motion capture being used to drive 3D animated avatars. Very different use cases, different algorithms for tracking, but there's, you know, there. this is the same space. We're ultimately talking about faces on cameras. And so Faceware has stayed on the firmly on that entertainment side of things and thus far and has um, taken the approach of the face is a way to drive content, to create content. Another thing that's interesting about the, the Faceware ecosystem is um, the notion of like a, a user in that ecosystem. Um, you, don't, you know, when you're using a product, you don't, you don't like log in as, Tim Stutz, you don't have a profile. You don't have a profile. I mean, you did when you signed up to 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 buy a product, but we just we're not capturing that kind of data. We're using it to just drive three D content in the end. So we're we're kind of like so far removed from that argument and to some degree that stigma. Um, but I think you know in the future we might a, a company like Faceware might be brought back in to the discussion, um, for instance, like with, with deep fakes and so forth. And like, we've already seen our technology used in a way to drive like photorealistic, uh, metahumans, unreal metahumans and so forth. And we've seen results where <laughs> it like, you couldn't tell, um, whether it's real or fake, not May not maybe not you per se, but most people might not know the difference, and so that's getting into a really interesting um, gray area for the tech. But yeah, most of the time, I think in answer to your question, most of the time we've we've been able to stay out of that. Um, we've been able to avoid like kind of sidestep the issue by just focusing on the entertainment market. You brought out some really interesting things and you mentioned about deep fakes. You, you spoke about, you know, unreal engines, meta humans, you know, I, I think what we are not seeing is, is that all of these are growing so rapidly that there's going to be huge questions popping up. You know, once these things starts kind of like poking in, you know, because it'll get more difficult to understand or distinguish between, you know, real media versus fake media. You know, where does that world lead on to? Tim, what are your views? You know, what do you think is going to be that uh, experience which is going to, like, really bring benefit to enterprise and consumers? Uh, there's a, a company called Oso VR, and their whole business model is around taking surgeons and training them on the many different procedures that they need to do, but on a VR headset. So historically, like if you're a surgeon and you're learning like, um, you're learning like a new operation, like on a knee, you might actually go and get flown off on an airplane to an offsite facility, a, a medical facility where you learn, um, you learn with other surgeons and 3D models and so forth, the actual <laughs> physical 3D models. And it's a very expensive procedure. And, you know, we know that surgery already is an uh, expensive industry. Um, a tool like Oso VR, like, uh, it's like a platform where surgeons, and rather than getting flown around to do these trainings, um, Oso VR will ship a device to the, the medical professional. A, it can just simply save time to, to learn a surgery this way. Uh, versus the alternative, but also save money. So I think we'll see, we're going to see a lot of things like that. And we're going to see them becoming more interactive, these kind of training things where, you know, it's cool, like to go into a factory setting and like, you know, stare at an engine block and see like an augmented reality overlay of parts and instructions what to do. But imagine if the system could also be 
aware of where you as a user were in that process. And like, if you had, if you had taken a step and, and, and hadn't set it up correctly, well, maybe the, the hardware um, that you're working on is plugged into uh, a, 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 like IOT kind of framework and the system knows you didn't finish the job correctly. So then it instructs you and gets you through it and, and adapts, adapts you through that learning process. Facebook Reality Labs is doing um, under uh, Thomas Reardon with the neuromotor inter- input device, the, the, that wrist wearable. Like that's really interesting work too. I mean, traditionally we think of uh, AR, VR as like a head worn display solution. And I think nowadays people have come to realize that Apple basically popularized this, that this is basically an AR uh, device as well. The, the mobile phone is, is that entry point. Um, but having other um, interfaces like the, the wrist wearable, measuring like neural impulse and so forth, and having that uh, register as, as, as input, um, you know, not only through different kinds of uh, biometric analysis, but, you know, being able to figure out how, like how, where your hand is spatially um, just through the, the sensory where alone is really exciting. I mean, the, the recent uh, Voices of VR podcast with uh, Kent Bai interviewing Reardon were just pretty fascinating. The fact that uh, this wrist wearable uh, system can learn from, from you, like as you are moving different fingers and eventually you don't, you don't even have to move your fingers at all. You can just imagine fingers and the brain is triggering the same kinds of impulses. So the system registers them as input. And then why stop at, um, why stop at five fingers? Why not have six fingers? Why not have a hundred fingers? It's as ma- it's really as many as, as it, whatever you can imagine. And so I like, this is opening up the door for access, for accessibility, of course, people who have maybe limited use of, of hands, um, but also just in general populations, just it's going to prove really interesting um, for input in general. Not possible now, but we could eventually be in a world where as soon as you put this wearable on, we, we have identified you. We not only know um, who you are, uh, but we understand things about you, like what kind of, um, like if you have a disability, what those are, we can tell it, it, if you have those, um, if you, you have those characteristics, the, the, the system knows. And it's like, well, what do we do with this data? And then there's a question of liability. Like we have this data, are we allowed to have this data? Should this data be removed and so forth? Uh, there is a human rights lawyer, uh, Britton Heller. Um, she has coined this term biometric psychography and it's basically understanding uh, our likes and dislikes entirely through that biometric footprint. And it's like the most private, sensitive kind of data. We can tell things like sexual orientation and so forth simply by um, the way these biometric sensors pick up and then process the data. So it's really, it's really sensitive data. And um, it's exciting to see Facebook in this space um, but it's going to be really challenging moving forward, not only earning the user's trust, but um, there's going to be um, a lot of li- there's going to need to be liability issues and, and so forth around this new data set. So uh, I think that all of these technologies are going to get magical and, and surveillance capitalism is going to be huge. And it's a moral obligation as being somebody who's vested in tech to tell the people that we have entered a world where you are going to be juiced by metrics and understanding or or thought patterns or or emotions and what what does the world look like? You know, it, it, it's it's just an open-ended question, and obviously the discussion could just stretch a, a long, long uh, era. So, w- w- what comes next for Tim starts? What comes? Uh, uh, and, and could you paint the future of AR VR in the next ten years? And and, and the same question to Shubhaji. Starting with where my direction, my next direction. Um, in the coming weeks, I'm actually going to be moving to a new opportunity. Um, 
Whereas before, like the past year has been more facial computing, I will be transitioning back to a spatial computing role. Um, in the role, I'll be focused on um, designing for enterprise use cases. And the role is also uniquely positioned in that the company that I'll be joining is a Magic Leap partner and a Microsoft partner. So I'll be designing experiences for both uh, Magic Leap and HoloLens. And so I am going to be thinking about problems that I hadn't had to think about before, which are like how we can run one cohesive experience between the two devices. How like, like when we design something for the HoloLens, can it be supported by the Magic Leap? The, the enterprise price tag is, is justified. It, it, can, it can pay for itself over time. It won't work globally but it, it has, um, in certain markets, there's a place for it. We know with like the US military and, and HoloLens, uh, you know, that, that contract that, the, that HoloLens has with the Army is huge. I mean, I think I read that budget in that contract was like the entire or over the entire um, investment in the whole industry in 2019. I mean, um, I think once, once Apple and, and, and Aria, are out on the market, um, the consumer, um, the consumer world will will explode and and, and and change overnight. I think almost the way that uh, uh, like with the release of the original iPhone, um, there will be ripple effect where those devices come out, and then you're going to see a lot of third party Android devices coming into the play space. I don't. I, I don't think for too long there will be other consumer devices, likely from the QWRs and and so forth. Yeah, and I, I don't want to get too dystopian about like where things are going, um, but I will say that um, you know, for in my own work, I'm very focused on privacy concerns. I've been um, a pretty strong advocate, especially since my time at Magic Leap, where I got to work on a system. Um, and I, I plan on, um, taking that seriously, um, with, with, with my next step, um, even though it's in the enterprise space as opposed to consumer, um, you know, we need to make sure we're doing best to protect, um, user data and so forth. So I will certainly be looking out for that in the future, but I also plan on, uh, remaining a critic of, uh, of, of Facebook and, and so forth and, the work that some of these companies are doing on the consumer side and just, and just, we need to continue to hold them accountable and have them share um, their discoveries and share their plans and spell out principles a little bit more broadly. Um, we wish you the very best for the new move, uh, Tim. So Shibajit, you want to uh, tell us the audience, what comes next for you and QWR? Future will unfold as it is, but what we can do is control the current situation so we can influence the future. And our work is mainly revolved in India and setting up the India for the next manufacturing hub. So with that goal in our mind, as, uh, as QWR and our founder, our founder and CEO Suraj, he has been taking a lot of initiative in educating the government. Because the, what is the biggest drawback we have saw is, uh, saw is that the government is not aware what is coming next. They are still stuck on the smartphone phase and they think the smartphone is the next market, but we are educating them that there is things that is beyond a smartphone and the technology that is involved in XR is quite different than a smartphone. So we have been working with METI. We have been taking a lot of government uh, initiative where we, we, uh, where we are planning to make an electronic manufacturing cluster with all core components of making an XR device, HMD, are in India and they can work, they can produce in India. And so we have a truly Indian device for first time ever. Currently, all the devices that you see in the Indian market, especially in HMD and smartphone phase, are not Indian. So our, in, our main focus is to have a truly made, uh, Indian uh, product which complies with the Atma Nirbhar initiative with uh, our prime minister and which is a correct direction to move forward on and coming to as my personal take i'm actually quite interested as a hardware uh, tech head i'm more into hardware i'm really interested how 
a battery technology would help the XR uh, devices. Being a battery, being a very niche component, but a very important component, battery needs to move forward. And especially considering lithium ion sitting near your face, that's yes. a ticking time bomb. That's literally a ticking time bomb with the Samsung fiasco right. that has happened recently back. Right. So we are looking to new technologies uh, where batteries like solid state batteries are the most promising one in replacing the current lithium ion. And the good thing about solid state battery is that you can mold the batteries into a device itself where in the previous generation where the body of a device is mostly plastic, now we can have the body as the battery itself with all the safety features of the, uh, all of the safety features that a plastic provides. So we are working on that. Wish you the very best. And yes, I completely agree with you that we need indigenous uh, products here in India. But, you know, from my perspective, I see that what's needed most is the world to come together. What's needed most is some all the big companies to create a framework which is interoperable, which is open source and, and which keeps the audience, the consumer or the enterprise, you know, and, and what they need first without kind of, you know, exploiting them in a way that, you know, you, you, you create out a outburst, which is, you know, which, which could be, uh, could be devastating for these, these big companies. So I wish and I pray that we break away from the boundaries. It's, it's a little bit idealistic that, you know, China, India, US, I mean, what happens in my country affects the entire world. And you know? so if we all join together, we could take this technology and, and these, you know, this exponential growth of technology and leverage it in a way that we create huge benefits for us and, and break away from a capitalist uh, nature. I think the world will get really, really great. And, and thank you, Tim. Thank you, Shubhajit, for being part of XRM Podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, please press the subscribe button. And until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.